All right, welcome everyone. So, uh, welcome to the second session. Last year, you will recall, uh, we met to discuss Gary Becker's theory of human capital uh, in conversation with, in confrontation with Michel Foucault's reading of Becker's theory and, uh, and Foucault's critique of neoliberalism. And that discussion was located primarily in Foucault's lecture of March 14, 1979, uh, in his Collège de France lectures on the birth of biopolitics. Now, in this second session, we will focus on Gary Becker's 1968 theory of crime and punishment and Foucault's discussion of that work in the following lecture, uh, which was delivered on March 21st, 1979. Um, and we're going to use that exchange to explore, just come on in, there's, uh, we're going to use that exchange to explore the relationship between Foucault's writing on penality from Discipline and Punish in 1975 through uh, the birth of biopolitics in 1979, um, and of course uh, the relationship between those writings and the economic theory of crime and punishment. Now we're dealing, I would say, with two seminal texts in the field of more broadly 20th century thought. Gary Becker's 1968 <coughs> article um, has been described for instance, by Judge Richard Posner, um, as uh, the, in Posner's tracing, actually, of the history of law and economics, um, the 68 article has been described at the origin or as the first shot. Um, Posner writes in 2001 that if one year must be picked for the beginning of the law and economic movement, it would be 1968. Why? Uh, because, as Posner writes, in 1968, Gary Becker published his article on crime, reviving and refining Bentham, and uh, thereby demonstrating, uh, in Posner's words, that no field of law could not be placed under the realm of economics with illuminating results. Uh, as for Foucault's work, uh, Discipline and Punish, and his lecture as well, those are perhaps the texts on punishment from the 20th century that have had the greatest influence uh, in the field and on Western contemporary theory. So to start us off uh, in this exchange, then, I'd like to turn first to François Eval, who, of course, was present uh, at the lectures, um, who was, at the time, uh, Michel Foucault's assistant at the Collège de France and one of Foucault's closest interlocutors. Um, I should note, once again, that Gary Becker has read the lecture, the March 21st, uh, 1979 lecture of Foucault, and uh, sent me an email again, uh, thinking thought, with some thoughts about uh, the fact that it's interesting, and of course asking the question whether there is disagreement or not. So, with that, François Evade. Songs, Songs. Professor for your time. When, when I came, I, I can think that I value, my value, my own value, can be so high to, to take a, a, a such kind, a, a such amount of your time. You understand? <laughs> 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 On songs to upgrade my self-esteem <laughs> of my value. <laughs> so I will uh, try to um, uh, to make uh, uh, three remarks about uh, uh, the Foucault's lesson, uh, your penalty. The first, the first remark uh, would would be about uh, the reason, maybe why Foucault was so interested by your work, on especially in respect of penalty. The second, my second remark uh, will be about uh, maybe new. Uh, Argument you can find not exactly in the, in, in this lesson, but but in discipline on punish. 
and the, the last one uh, will be uh, about uh, what I know penal judgment and uh, uh, economy uh, of justice. First, the first, first remark. <clears throat> I think the connection uh, between you and Foucault, uh, the first connection is a methodological one. And uh, you find in your work uh, the possibility of a critique of governmentality. You, I think we have to understand critic in a politi political sense, but also in a philosophical one, sense of crit Kantian critic. And it tells uh, that your kind of critic of governmentality is cynicist. Yes, such as written. Uh, on by Foucault, that is uh, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> because cynic, the cynicist, the cynic by Foucault are a kind, this kind of people, they um, define a new, a certain kind of possibility of trust telling. Truth telling. Truth, Truth telling, telling yes. Yeah. Totally. And your critic of governmentality is, has, gives the capacity to be uh, true. And without, outside of moral consideration. The second reason um, is, I think, maybe Foucault. Uh, find in your, uh, in your work a, um, an help. Um, when he wrote, after the, the writing of Discipline and Punish, so Discipline and Punish make a, a, a very hard criticism on the modern penalty, the modern art of Punish, but the end was without solution. And a lot of people asked to Foucault, OK, prison or our public, penal public policy uh, don't work, but what could be the solution? And you give for him an alternative to the modern penal, to the modern public policy. And he, uh, there is a two or three manner in, 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 in this lesson. And he explained, you, uh, with you, we have the possibility to quit homo criminalis, homo, uh, uh, yes, homo criminalis for a new kind of uh, uh, vision of objectivation of criminal that is homo economicus. That is, that, that is very interesting, that is the idea that there is no particular psychology of criminal, but uh, a criminal is, is a man in the street. Uh, what difference that is his relationship with risk? Uh, um, in this uh, respect, you, uh, I think, maybe you were like a liberator for uh, for Foucault in this uh, in this new objectivation uh, of uh, of criminal. The last connection uh, between you and Foucault. Is, certain, is certainly the idea that a public policy, a good public policy in crime, against crime, is not, has not 
like a goal to eradicate the crime. But uh, the, the good policy is to make that the offer of crime is, will be the lower possible in such condition of, uh, of uh, allocation of, uh, of money. And here you uh, uh, meet a very important uh, question by Foucault, that is, for Foucault, it is very important that the power has a limit and gives the possibility for the people to play, uh, that is, the possibility for illegalism in the society. Maybe that is a point where it can be in disaccord. You, 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 you don't agree. Well, what was it? Oh, can you just restate that? I'm not quite sure what you meant. Yes, uh, it's, it's for Foucault, uh, there is also in our society, in a, in a liberal society, at your time, there is uh, the temptation for the power to search, to control each, comp each behavior, each person, each agent. This is a, a total power. And against that, we have to manage possibility uh, limit to, to the power. And there is a part, a, a, a field of tolerance. Uh, that, that is uh, the word of Foucault, very, very important. And this, this, this part of tolerance, that is a part of right, uh, in the sense of, for Foucault, in the sense of bill of right. In this, thanks to this limit, we have right against uh, to be outside of her, to be not exactly in the domination of power. That, that for me, that, that are, uh, these are the three reasons of connection. Uh, you critic, an alternative, and the idea, and he share with you this idea, this idea of tolerance. My second point is what help you can find by Foucault in discipline and punish. Maybe the possibility to complete your economic analysis of crime. The purpose of Foucault in discipline and punish is also an economic one. one. On the, the word that only is that is a little metaphoric, but the word by Foucault is a search to describe economic of power. But there is a tentative to have a new vision, a new uh, description of power in relationship with the idea of economics. But by him, economy, that is not your, exactly your economy, but that is economy in sense of to have a strategy, to have a calculus. But in this sense, you, the both are uh, connected. And in this respect, what could be for, for you interesting? The main thesis, one of the main theses of Foucault in Discipline and Punish is prison, like penalty, is a failure. That don't work. That is completely wrong. The goal are absolutely not uh, achieved. achieved. The goals of the prison. Yes. But this failure is a benefit <coughs> that gives to the power the benefit to come to control a certain kind of population, the population who has to go in jail on with the control of this population to control the crime. And I think that is interesting, but it, in, in which uh, uh, part you have to take in consideration in the cost of crime or in the benefits, the side effects of a wrong politics. I don't know 
what could be the traduction, the translation for uh, oh, yeah. in the economy in, 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 the, in the yeah. policy. But that is the idea that maybe behind a failure there is an advantage. And also, but what is the value of this advantage? Maybe between the balance between the failure of prison and the cost of prison and the control and the benefits of the control of the criminality is present is maybe is not so expensive like for example a, a central agent intelligence agency to make control of crime. So that is uh, uh, and I think second maybe you have also to add in the calculus of the cost and benefit of crime uh, the value of uh, given by the management of, of crime and the exercise of power. S through the, this kind of public policy, power finds the capacity, the possibility to exerce his domination. And th that that is important. There is a value. But in you, maybe, I, I am not an expert. In your consideration, what cost and benefit is taken by the budget, by the state budget? Uh, uh, and maybe you have to, maybe, have we, to add some other value that are not des described in a state budget about what is cost and, and benefit of, of crime. So my last remark, uh, maybe uh, please uh, you have to be indulgent. Before I say, uh, Foucault find by you, in your work the possibility of a new kind of critic. But your work is not only a critical. There is also proposition about what has to be the penal judgment. What I know in penal judgment, that is uh, something complex. That is, that I, I mean that in penalty, we have uh, two uh, different kinds of judgment. The first one is a judgment of conviction. We have to establish uh, this uh, fact, this illegality is to be attributed to this person. Uh, maybe judgment of conviction. And the second one is this person which, who is convicted, what kind of penalty? So that is a second judgment. So difficulty, that there are what kind of relationship between the both? And you give a solution about that. Or you give a vision about the both. In the first, about the judgment of conviction, you give uh, arguments about, for example, uh, the certainty for in your vision, certainty to be uh, convicted is very important in, in a penalty. Uh, uh, the rapidity it is, is also very, very important. But you have also uh, a, a response, proposition about judgment of penalty. Uh, it seems again that is very difficult for me, and especially in English. The, par the difficulty for you uh, in uh, this, penal, this penal judgment is you define a penalty which is not addressed to the murder, but to the other possible murder. Not to the particular defendant, but yes. to other defendants, oh, right? Yeah. General theory of yeah. deterrence, right? Yes. And you need, you, you, that is a, 
Okay, question. And naturally, we have to ask, so we have to ask how it is possible, uh, what she, which is the just rule to attribute to this defendant, to this particular defendant, the possibility to prevent the next defendant. In this respect, the form of your penal judgment is predictive. With, if, with all of Earth's certainty linked to this kind of prediction about what could be the reaction, the effect of this penalty for, for those. On the consequence, uh, maybe, would be, uh, yes, you have to make a lot of differentiation between kind of, kind of crime, kind of criminals, uh, and, and so on. And I think that is a very, a very big difficulty in to make that in, uh, in practice. And that at this point, you are in, in conflict with the logic of law. The logic of law is a logic, is a universal logic. So the law is addressed to a normal, to, to a general man. On you, for you, penalty has to be perpetually differentiated for, for, each, for each case. That is uh, a, a complexity. How it is possible to make a conciliation between the generality of a public, poli public uh, policy of punishment on this idea that this public has to be adapted to each uh, situation, to each case. And you need for that a lot of knowledge about the com and maybe you cross the criminal the criminology you cross the, on at the first step you forget uh, criminology the object crimin criminologist uh, objectivation but at the end you, you maybe you you have to use such kind of uh, my last uh, last remark You face, uh, I think, you face, but I, I speak uh, with respect, uh, and with respect for the courage of your uh, statement, for your uh, uh, position about, for example, this uh, capital punishment. But we, we can, uh, have some uh, uh, question. In, the, in your blog about capital punishment, you give this equation, this equation uh, for murder, death penalty is valid because these ones are sensible to this risk to be uh, uh, to this, uh, for this uh, and you make this reasoning. So, in the case where one death, one capital punishment, uh, the cost of one capital punishment give uh, five lives saved. Naturally, the cost benefit analysis say yes. And you pursue the reasoning until the case where there is the cost is one capital punishment and in faith in at the other side there is only one life saved. And you say also in this 
in this uh, situation, I choose. Uh, I have. I choose a cap the capital punishment. Why? Why? Because you say the value of life of the both are not the same. The murderer, the life of the murderer has not the same value that the life of the innocent. OK. We can agree with you. <laughs> but two questions. The first one, in this kind of sentence, your evaluation is not exactly an economic one. That is a moral one, in part. And when you say such kind of thing, the murderer is absolutely condemned for the future of his, of, of, of his life. And you don't know what could be the future of the life of the, of the innocent. I think at this, at this place, your, the evaluation of the price of life change. That is not exactly an economic one about uh, in relation of risk, but that is a more, um, such a moral one. But on here, and also, at this place, you are in conflict or in concurrence, in competition with other kind of evaluation. For example, I don't know if you are Christian, but in my, uh, when I was young, uh, I read the Evangel. And here in the Evangel, I find some dance where uh, Jesus uh, said about the criminal, for my father, the criminal, for my father, Madeleine, has the same price, maybe a better price, than this one who is uh, a good moral person. For me, that I, my question is, is, is it, isn't the limit of this, of the economical reasoning? Uh, is it the, pres the presupposition of the economic analysis that is everything has a, has a value and this value can be expressed by, by a price? in a money value. And the question here, with death penalty, is, is with the life to evaluate the life and the future of life of a person, is that possible to make such kind of evaluation? And that would be the reason, because you choose at this time a moral one, and not exactly an, an economic economical one. So that was my, my Roma. Thanks a lot <laughs> <laughs> to give me the possibility to meet you. Right. <laughs> Gary, do you want to address some of those comments? Well, let me address it in the broader context. Mm -hmm. Okay? I will come to some of the comments, definitely, because they're very interesting comments. I uh, appreciate them. Now, let me first come back to Foucault, uh, basically. So, I'm no expert on Foucault, one, unlike both of you. In fact, the only thing I've read of Foucault are those two essays that you have me read. I should be reading more if I was sensible, because um, what I found in reading these two essays, my belief about modern French philosophers were that they were opaque, <laughs> impossible to understand. <laughs> <laughs> and so I read Foucault. These two essays, they're lectures in translation, so obviously not the best for, from the point of view of giving clarity, and yet they were clear. I mean, I understood what he was saying and generally agreed with most of what he said, which I'll, I'll, I'll come to in a little while. But um, I, I thought they were perceptive, clearly written, 
not hiding behind a lot of complicated phraseology that didn't amount to anything. So, uh, to me, it was said I should be reading more of, of him, but, uh, a, a very good thinker. Now, in, in discussing his comments on my work, let me first give people here who probably may not be that familiar with my paper on crime a very short synopsis of what I do. And then I'll discuss some of Foucault's comments on them. And then I'll discuss, uh, for instance, your comments. Uh, <clears throat> I set up a very simple model, fundamentally. It's a normative. It, it's, uh, explicitly, it was normative. The, and the normative question was, we have laws, and I don't evaluate whether these are good laws or not. And I'll come back to that in the context of what Foucault says. We have laws, and we try to discourage up to a point, only up to a point, um, violation of these laws. And so the question posed in that essay is what's the optimal way to approach that kind of problem? And when, when I say optimal, it means taking account of various considerations. So you have to integrate several different types of considerations in order to see the, this problem and, and try to attack the problem. Now, what are the considerations? Well, first of all, you have the laws, and then you have some assessment about what the cost is to society of violating these laws, what Foucault calls, I don't know if I use that language, at the externality involved. Then you have the crim uh, potential criminals, and how can you deter their behavior with the instruments you have available? And what are the instruments? Well, in the crime and punishment paper, I stress two instruments, name, and you, you mentioned them in, in your discussion, the likelihood that you're going to apprehend and convict somebody, and the, the magnitude and nature of the punishment that you impose. Now, the framework there, of course, deals with other instruments, like maybe a, a more effective way to reduce crime is to educate the uh, population better, so their opportunities are better in non-criminal activity. But uh, you have various instruments, and the paper focuses on the probability of conviction and the magnitude of the punishment. And punishment can take different forms. It could be a fine. In fact, I argue the one possible fine is actually the best form of punishment from an effect efficiency, effectiveness point of view. But it also, of course, often deals with imprisonment for the more serious crimes because fines are not adequate for a variety of reasons in those situations. Now, it's costly. It's costly to impose punishment. Uh, police, the imprisonment or other types of punishment, the uh, judiciary, so a variety of costs. And these costs, and this is important, these costs limit how much you want to do in terms of the punishment. Uh, and I'll come back to Foucault's comments on that a little bit later. And finally, you have how responsive are criminals to different punishments. So if criminals respond a lot, in Foucault's language, I don't know if I, I, I guess I use it in my paper, if criminals are very elastic to the punishment, this is a language Foucault uses in his lecture, um, then that will affect, may, maybe you want to, maybe a small amount of punishment can have a big effect. On the other hand, if criminals are very unresponsive, then you say, well, maybe the punishment won't do any good because you won't be able to deter. And when I say criminals, I don't mean not simply the criminal that you are punishing in a particular courtroom, but the, all criminals who might be engaging in theft, robbery, rape, and other uh, murder, and, and other crimes. So it's, it's not an individual, even though the theory is based on individual, it's really it's the group behavior that you're concerned about. How to punish an X affect the criminal activities of Y, Z, and everybody else. Okay? Now it's, clue, it's true when you punish X by putting X in prison, you prevent them from, from committing crime, at least against non-prisoners while they're in prison, right? But basically, you, 
the, the framework contrary, how do you affect other people? If you don't have much effect on other people, that says, well, maybe you don't want to use this instrument very much, because you really can't accomplish a lot with this instrument. So, I mean, you may like to do it, but the cost of doing it is too great. So that's the framework. So you have, what are the components of it? Well, you have the laws, you have the potential criminal, and the approach doesn't say there's one type who are criminals and another type who isn't. I mean, it doesn't make any distinction. In, fundamentally, it's, of course, some people may be more willing to obey the law for, for non-punishment reasons, of course, but it doesn't say there's some criminal type based on physiology, or, or, or et cetera. That it, it basically says that most, if not everybody, can be affected if you have the right sort of instruments, including education and punishment. So you have the criminal, you have the laws, you have the cost of enforcing the laws, and then you come out with some conclusion about how much you want to do with regard to different crimes and with regard to different types of individuals. That's the framework um, that Foucault is commenting on. Okay. So then I, I, I read Foucault's um, essay, and here I'll have to look at some of the comments I made uh, as I was reading the essay. Foucault doesn't like ne neoliberalism, okay? And he, he classifies me as a neoliberal. And I am a neoliberal, I suppose, whatever that term means. But um, I, I'm a liberal, a classical liberal, I, I would classify myself as, and that sometimes meant as a neoliberal. So he doesn't like neoliberalism. In the first part of this chapter, he criticizes some other neoliberals, Rupke and, and some of the others, and then he criticizes Bentham. I, I don't know if you would call him a neoliberal, but he criticizes Bentham and becker Rhea, and so on. All right, so he puts me in his class of neoliberals, but as I read the essay, um, it's hard for me to see something in that essay that Foucault doesn't like in, in terms of my, <laughs> my work. I mean, and I'll tell you, I'll look at his various comments he makes. Um, what he likes is, he, he, he starts out when he discusses my, uh, my essay, I mean, and he's discussing also essays by some other economists, important, important essays by George Stigler, a colleague and friend of mine, and former student of mine, Isaac Ehrlich, and the like. Um, but he mainly focuses on, on my essay, so I'll act as if it's my essay, but there's other literature that he discusses. He says, well, Becker says the purpose, uh, that all one is interested in, it, in terms of crime, is uh, affecting the risk of committing various crimes. And then he says there's laughter. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the writing says there's laughter and, uh, in that it, it definition. And, and Foucault, Foucault scolds his audience. He says, no, you shouldn't laugh at that. That's what the French p penal code is, basically. So it's not, it's not a bad approach. I mean, it's not a bad approach to the problem, OK? That's how he starts off. Um, and what he likes about that approach, and what he doesn't like about Bentham and, uh, in particular, is there's no attempt to have a calculus of what laws there should be or shouldn't be in that approach. I mean, there's other literature that goes into it, and I've gone into that literature, as in the capital punishment case, um, uh, and partly in other cases. But he says there's no attempt in this approach. One doesn't try to do that. He, he likes that. Okay, because he's critical of a lot of laws that, that get passed. Okay, the second thing he, he, he agrees he, di he he just likes Bentham because his interpretation of Bentham and I didn't go back to read Bentham, but I, it seemed to me right was that Bentham wanted to, thought he could eliminate all crime by having the right punishment in this prison where every every criminal you see him all the time, no privacy and the like. Um, uh, and he, he says, but in, in this approach, this, this, this economic approach, one recognizes cost of punishment, so there's an optimal amount of crime. I mean, I like to, to challenge people a lot, and I say, the theory is about the optimal amount of crime. Now, optimal in what sense? Well, the different meanings that you can give to the word optimal, but the meaning that I'm giving it in this context is optimal in the sense that it, you have to benefit the value of trying to reduce crime versus the gain. And Foucault gives an example. Uh, I like the example. Uh, it was not you know, up in the air, but a very practical example of how to reduce theft of inventory in a store. 
say, well, if the theft is a high rate, you can cut it down pretty easily from 50% to 40% to 30%. You go through a bunch of numbers. You say, but when you get on the 5% to cut it down anymore, it's going to be very costly. It probably doesn't pay to do it. So that's the optimal amount of theft in that case would be 5%, let's say. And I think that's absolutely right. It's a very good example. And it's certainly fundamental um, to this type of approach. Now, the third thing it seems to me you liked was it recognizes that there's no fundamental person who you can identify as a criminal by the physiology, the genetics, and so on. Maybe ge genetics will eventually tell us something about it. We certainly don't know that now. We know there are a lot of influence in determining whether pe people commit crime and different types of crime, that people commit white-collar crimes that are different in terms of education and background, typically, than people commit assaults and felonies of, of various types. Uh, so there's not a criminal individual per se, uh, but uh, they're different individuals and they're affected differently to be sure, however, by punishment uh, and depends on the nature of the individual or the nature of the individuals committing a crime and the nature of the crimes. So you have this heterogeneity both by, by type of crime and type of individual and in, in principle you'd like to tailor the punishments to uh, take account of this type of heterogeneity. Now, you may not know enough to be able to do it, but you try to do what you can in that regard. So, here's an example of, let's say, drugs. Now, I, my paper doesn't discuss drugs, although I've sitting, since written a fair amount on the, on the drug question. And he says, well, people respond differently. The addict, he, he says, is not at all responsive to price. I, I think that's not right. Uh, the addict is only a, a bit responsive, but in the long run, it can be considerably responsive. So modern analysis, I think data. If you look at data, addicts respond to punishment uh, and, and higher price. But they may, uh, in general, respond less. So people respond differently, and you want to have maybe different punishments for the addict and the person who's just starting out in taking drugs, if you want to re reduce the incidence of drugs. That's, that's his approach. A high price for the person who's experimenting, so they don't experiment, and a low price for the addict because they're addicted, you're not going to do any good, and, and if you have a high price, they'll just commit a lot of crime and so on, so you want to cut that down. So and there's a lot, of, a lot of insight in in that analysis, and aside from uh, I, I wouldn't agree that addicts aren't responsive, but, but the basic framework, I think, is, uh, is, is the right one. So th those are my basic comments on Foucault. So my conclusion was, I think, Bernard, you asked me, well, let's, wh where did Foucault agree and where did he disagree? And I didn't find any place where he explicitly disagreed. I mean, I mean I, in this essay. Now, maybe in his other work he does. He, you know, it's hard to tell how much he's expositing what I'm saying and how much he's agreeing <laughs> with what I'm saying. But he wasn't hesitant to disagree with Bentham and Rupke and some of the other Neelder. But I don't see anything in there that he's really disagreeing. So maybe we'll come back, uh, we'll come back uh, yeah. to that. Now, let me come to your comments. Uh, um, I agree with a lot of what you said. Some of them are related to what I said. Uh, yeah, I'll come to, but let me just mention a few of them. Criticism of government uh, and analysis aside from moral reasoning. And I'll come back to the capital punishment issue that you raised. Uh, nowhere in my essay do I discuss capital punishment, by the way, but my former student Ehrlich discussed capital punishment and some subsequent blogs I discussed capital punishment. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stand behind what I said about capital punishment, but I'll have to come back to that later on. Um, uh, so it's not, it's not taking a moral stand on, uh, on laws and, and government, it's just looking at how you can affect uh, the adherence to these laws. And I, I agree. Um, uh, there's no psychology of the criminal you mentioned, and I agree. There's not a psychology of the criminal. I think most attempts to give it a psychology of the criminal have really misled uh, penology and um, uh, how to deter crime. So I, 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 what I was trying to do in this essay was free one's thinking from that approach uh, to uh, criminology. Um, 
not to eradicate crime. You mentioned that. I agree 100%. Uh, limits to the power of the state. That implies the limits to the power of the state because they can only do a limited amount of, of activities, uh, which I agree. Um, economy of power. I mean, absolutely. A, a neoliberal believes is w very much worried about the power of the state and what laws get passed and so on. And that's why neoliberals come out with a generally for a small state, a limited state. Now, I haven't read Cru uh, Foucault's other work on power, um, but I, don't, I mean, I think overall, on the basic picture, I would tend to agree uh, with that. You want to have an economy of power. It's, it, it too, it's too easily corrupted. Um, and uh, and impri imprisonment is, can be used to as, as a way of enforcing the power of the state. And uh, certainly, it's, it, it's a great concern of uh, myself and, uh, and ne neoliberals in general. Uh, in this essay, it, it, you know, it recognizes that you may be imprisoning people for the wrong reasons. They're not criminals. You're doing other things, and so you, you have you have to balance. Uh, I mean, and even if the intent is right, the evidence is limited. You convict people on limited evidence, and so you have to have a procedure whereby I mean, you want to have a procedure whereby you can reevaluate the evidence in the light of additional evidence, and and so that's what the appeal process does in, in most societies. You want to provide a lot of protection in, in, in that dimension, and um, I think this approach uh, certainly does that. Now, fundamental to the approach, and I, I think you you didn't use the word, is deterrence. Uh, I don't think in your discussion you, you didn't use the word deterrence, but you're really describing deterrence, and deterrence is fundamental to this type of approach. I agree with you on that. Um, you can't deter, you don't do, because it's costly to do, um, basically. Basically, I mean, there's a couple of qualifications to that. Now, my last comment would be on capital punishment. The theory is silent on whether you want capital punishment or not. I mean, and it's, it's a calculation. What's the advantage in terms of what's the deterrent effect of capital punishment? If capital punishment didn't deter, uh, then maybe you, you keep people, you, keep, you still want to keep, prevent murderers from uh, uh, committing additional murders, so you may keep them in prison, so on. That, that's, that's fine. So you could easily come out with this theory and say you're opposed to capital punishment. I don't have the slightest argument with that. Now, when I discuss the capital punishment in, in, my, in my blog, well, let me tell you a funny, well, to me it was a funny story about this. I gave a lecture in Italy for roughly 2,000 individuals. So it was a huge audience. And I was lecturing about education, nothing to do with this topic. And there was a Q&A period, and somebody got up to me and the boy, he was obviously very emotionally involved. He said, you have written in favor of capital punishment. You should be thrown out of Italy for doing that. Um, so <laughs> I said, well, I wasn't talking about capital punishment. But I went in and discussed my, my views on capital punishment. Um, and he calmed down a little bit <laughs> on that. Um, so, Say so the theory is agnostic about whether you want to use capital punishment. The view I took in my blog, and I still take, depends upon how much you can reduce subsequent murders by capital punishment. And if you can reduce a lot, you know, uh, then uh, and and you all, remember you're comparing capital punishment to alternatives. So let's say life in prison is is an alternative. Uh, in fact, most crim people convicted of murder do not spend life imprisonment. In fact, in the United States, I don't know the French situation. But if, life, say, life imprisonment was the alternative, then you want to say, what additional deterrent effect and cost are involved in capital punishment versus others, recognizing that you may be making an error when you convict somebody of murder and you have to watch the appeal process. So you may conclude from that uh, the additional benefit is not worth the cost, both in terms of improper conviction and the like. Okay? 
So why do I conclude, therefore, that I favor capital punishment? Because I, said, I make the judgment based on very poor and limited evidence. There's a great controversy in the empirical evidence. Let me co hold up for a moment and come, uh, come to uh, make a more broader point, and I'll come to that. Well, I said at the beginning, the essay was normative, asking what, the, what should gov what governments do, what would be best policy. It, it, it had in it a lot of positive or empirical aspects to it. How big is deterrence? Does it differ from you send anybody to prison or you find them or if you increase the probability of apprehension? What's the cost of punishing people? How do you change that by varying your police force and the like? And so it led to a lot of empirical work based on trying to assess for different types of crimes and so on, how can you de deter crime, including things like increasing education, providing, reducing unemployment, providing better opportunities for, for, for individuals who might commit felonies. So it led to a lot of empirical work, okay? Now on the basis, and, and some of that empirical work, a small, very small fraction of that empirical work dealt with capital punishment, and the evidence is, is, is mixed on that. Uh, some con studies conclude the capital punishment had very little deterrent effect, some studies conclude that capital punishment had a pretty sizable effect, starting with the early study, but other subsequent studies, and so it is mixed. So, um, I, and in, in, I, I said, I don't, the exact evidence isn't clear, but we have to have a policy. My judgment is that capital punishment does deter uh, murder. And then I go into this calculate, this discussion that you, you, don't, you didn't like, and I'll, I'll try to defend what I was doing. I said, well, most people would, would agree that if we were convinced that capital punishment, by using capital punishment, you reduce five, the murders by num five murders for each capital punishment reduced, most people would be inclined to say, well, we don't like capital punishment, but we're going to use it. Okay? Just like we don't like going to war, but we're going to use it. All right? So the question I asked was, where is the dividing line? Where is the dividing line? Well. Nobody knows where the dividing line is, so uh, because a lot of people don't ask that question, they usually just say, "Well, I don't like capital punishment," without asking, "Well, are you are you saving lives? How many lives are you saving?" And if, if you had put hypothetical, if I could save one life, I'll come to your example, if I could save one life, would I be in favor of capital punishment? Well, that's a tough one. Not easy. You're taking one life and you're saving one additional life. And I argue there, and it, is, it was a judgment, and one can, it, it doesn't come out, I mean, it comes out of maybe some other analysis. There is a whole literature, as you know, on the statistical value of life, which tries to measure, measure that. Uh, and so I could in integrate that into this, and if I did that, I would come to the conclusion, yes, on the whole, it's worth taking, <laughs> it's worth using the capital punishment because the life you're saving is gonna be some innocent person. It's more valuable the life you're taking, is going on the whole be somebody's going to commit other crimes and so on. So, but you, you uh, if you accepted that, here, I'll push you further. Say you take, you agree, one one. What about 0.75 to one? You say three quarters of a life for the murder you take. Well, that's getting tougher. What about a half? I mean, I don't know where to, to draw the line. But I, I did, I, I do believe that most people would conclude that if you felt capital punishment deterred at least one life um, for each capital punishment, most people would say, well, I don't like it, but I'm, it's, it's worth using, taking it down of all the costs. So I'm just about finished. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, so that, that, that's the basic, uh, my basic comments. I'll, I'll summarize what they are, aside from giving a, a outline of what, what I try to do in the paper. And remember, capital punishment was not in the paper, and I don't consider that an important part of the work on the economics of crime. I mean, because you could take that either way, you can have either conclusion. It doesn't have a conclusion about capital punishment. But it is a framework for discussing a lot of different crimes. And I, I read Foucault on, uh, on this. I like what he said. Uh, maybe because, I, because he was agreeing with well, a lot of what I said. Um, but. I didn't detect, even though he doesn't like neoliberalism, and he classifies me explicitly as a neoliberal, which is right, I didn't detect any significant criticism. So maybe I'm wrong about that. I'd like to, you know, discuss some of them if they're, if they're wrong. All right, so let me try to sharpen the exchange then. Um, 
in, in a couple of ways. So um, last time we were talking about human capital, and I think we did identify at least and have a discussion about one of the critiques of that work, and which had to do with investments and disinvestments in populations that would kind of follow from that. But let's put that aside for a second and move to the, this chapter, which is really about crime and punishment. And um, here I think that the the writing, and this is a reading, so I mean, this is a reading and analysis of the kind of rationality that is in, that, it, that forms the basis of your article. Mm -hmm. But I think that it does motivate two critiques. Um, and uh, to a certain extent, unfortunately, those two critiques come out in the next lecture, so we're going to have to have a third <laughs> session. Um, but it motivates two critiques, the first of which has to do with the particular type of governability, the ter particular type of uh, governable actor that is assumed and that forms part of the uh, very kind of basis of the rational actor model. Um, that is a part, of course, and that comes out from uh, Crime and Punishment in 68. And so, and so this is this idea, of course, that um, uh, in fact, it's, 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 it's at that moment when the audience laughs. I mean, actually, where the, when, that, uh, when the audience laughs, I think it's a critical moment in the essay, in some sense, because of paths not taken. Um, but it is a critical moment for a certain form of critique, because that's where he distinguishes the distinction between <laughs> French penal law and your model is the distinction is same definition of crime so it's a formal definition of crime right same thing but a different view and one view is from your view is from the rational actor in the model right and the french view is from the sovereign in the model and this differential produces kind of a different way of thinking about and then governing individuals and it produces and it's that differential the fact that we're now looking at it from the view of the rational actor from the individual's point of view that it's that way that produces the unique mode of governability of neoliberalism that is defined by behavioral techniques and environmental changes etc and that include and and so that's on that's on page 252 i mean the notion of governability is on the page 252 right. of the english edition but then actually the the payoff or the critique comes in the next lecture around and uh, uh branch 270 where he talks about kind of the the more strict or aberrant ways of uh, behavioral techniques associated, for instance, with Skinner. So, but it is, in some sense, a, 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 yeah, I don't a want to way, associate yeah, with Skinner. Yeah, really. yeah no, 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 I know, no, no, he's not. He's not associating you with that. But it is kind of that is the that is the slope, or that is something about that. All right. The second critique that this motivates is something is is an epistemological you want to question. At each critique, or you want to give the set of critiques. You know, actually, let, let me give them quickly, okay. and then let me give them quickly. Okay. And the second one has to do with the fact that that same it, he talks about it as a theory of subject, but it has to do with an epistemology of um, uh, of, of of governance what we can know and what we can know well and what we can't know well. This idea of the rational actor is one that leads towards um, uh, uh, the, the knowability is of personal interests, of interests, uh, in contrast to a state that, that doesn't have knowledge in this way. Or, and, and so that there's this connection uh, between um, the rational actor knowing his interests best being faced in, instead by a governing body that does not uh, ha that whose whose calculations misfire because they don't have the knowledge that produces itself the need for limited government intervention. That in other words, the limited government intervention is kind of built into the theory of the subject, um, and that we we'll do it at the next session also in more depth. Um, we'll be at page two eighty two of the English edition. Where you get this idea that it, that it basically the theory ultimately disqualifies the, politi the, the political sovereign, but I do, but but on specifically on the 1968 essay, mm -hmm. all right. So these these are critiques that will emerge out of his reading of the 1968 essay. But I would I would say that um, at that point where he defends you against his French audience. 
um, it's very critical because, and when he chastises the audience, it's very critical because he takes a formalist move that, in my opinion, then means that he misses the target a little bit, um, and and that they're right he there. Foucault. He, Foucault, misses the target, i.e., you. Okay, at, at that juncture, in terms of adopting a kind of a formalist take on law, because, I, and and so let me just add this third piece here. Um, uh, and, and the point is that by not challenging a formalist definition of what the law is in your work, right? in other words, by taking the legal code as a limiting factor to define the behaviors that we are then going to subject to, some, to a social welfare analysis, okay? You are doing a few things. You're, you're bracketing out perhaps some of the most important material. Now, I can understand that it's an attempt to, hi to find kind of a partial equilibrium here, right? We're bracketing out the definition of crime. But on the other hand, it seems to me that what you've done by bracketing out uh, the definition of crime is, is problematic for three reasons. First, you're bracketing out the whole complexity of the problem, the problem of the criminal law, where all of the morality, all of the theories of dangerousness, all of the psychiatry, et cetera, are going to be playing at play, right? So, so you're, you are trying to create a theory that brackets that off, but you're, you've almost done it at the beginning by bracketing <coughs> off the definition of crime. You also avoid, I think, the radical potential for your own theory. Um, and, 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 and you also create some tension or some um, tension between what you can then say, for instance, with regard to drugs. Um, and the tension here, uh, there's an internal tension in the sense that ultimately you might want to say we should decriminalize drugs, right? At the end of, uh, uh, this is not in this text, but it's kind of in other work. I do believe in that. Yeah, yeah. you do believe in that. But, but you, you, there's this tension not because... this theory leads to that conclusion. Right, right, but right. But the, the tension being, well, wait a minute, I mean, we're taking the definition of crimes as given, right? So how is it that a social welfare analysis would then lead to the elimination of a definition of crime? Okay, so I think that this, that's the particular tension that I would want to push you on, because I think what it reveals is that there, there would have been a more radical theory in 68 for you which would have been to subject all human behavior to the kind of calculus that you subject criminal behavior to, all right? Um, any behavior uh, that could be punished properly in the right amount such that it would maximize social welfare or minimize social costs, right, um, would have been, it seems to me, the theory that you would have, should have argued in 1968 any human behavior that can be efficiently regulated by means of the criminal sanction, by punishment, should be what we should punish, right? Now, and if you had done that, of course, all domains of economic, social, political life would have been subjected to potential punishment. It opens all human activity to the state sanction, um, including anything. I mean, we could just make the list, right? Infidelity, impoliteness, sexism, protest. I mean, uh, political contributions to parties. Any activity could be subjected to that kind, to the kind of analysis that you're proposing, which would then, and then we would then know what is criminal is that which, if you efficient, you can efficiently regulate by punishment. And some things we can efficiently regulate by punishment, some things you can't. But based on, and so, based on that move of taking the law in its formal definition, I think you limited uh, what the theory could have done, but I think you also injected into the theory a particular political vision, a, a particular vision, somewhat, a somewhat libertarian uh, vision or values that are lurking in the decision to bracket law, to bracket the definition. And so at that point, I think, a missing target or something, or, or what, what a critique there could have been that you are that the the decision to bracket the formalism reveals a bias uh, that would make one suspicious about the positivistic nature of the model itself and about all of the measurements that would then have to be made. Complicated measurements, right? These are really complicated measurements, but it makes us suspicious that something 
is biased in some way um, against intervention. And the final point, the final point on the death penalty, yeah. um, right. on the death penalty, yeah. when you say... But I don't want to spend a lot of time on the death no, penalty. No, me neither. But it's, it's a good, a it's an illustration. I think it's an illustration of the same thing, <laughs> yeah. which is when you say um, how many lives are we saving, right, that calculation itself... So Gary Becker wouldn't just ask how many lives are we saving, right? Gary Becker would have to ask the next question, which is the much more complicated question, of how much money does it cost to engage in an execution, a capital punishment? How, many, how much money would that save in health care? How many, how many lives would that save in health care if we used it differently, et cetera, right? In other words, we don't limit ourselves simply to the fact that it deters. Lots, everything deters. Death penalty for parking violation deters. We have to do the much more, com and it's not only a question of how many lives, but it becomes the whole huge issue of could the money be better spent saving lives in some other domain? At which point, I think you have to throw up your hands and say, you know, I, I'm not. In, I can't say I'm in favor of the death penalty. I can't say I'm against the death penalty. I'd say it's a it's a hugely, massively complicated calculus that involves lots of different things. Not just whether it's one life to one life, but also um, how much money are we spending for lawyers? Should we be spending that money differently, etc.? So I think that Gary Becker would have to say, I, I don't know the answer to this complex question. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> well, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me respond to these comments. Uh, I mean, this this essay has limited had a limited goal. We're not trying to say what laws should we have or what laws shouldn't we have. If we have some laws, how are we going to engage in the terms with regard to these laws? Now, in in my other manifestations, my other writing, of course I've written a lot about what laws we should have. I mean, and I believe uh, that there's a lot of uh, risk of uh, government over-regulating society, too many laws and so on. So that's why I've, I've been a small government person. But so this essay has a more modest goal. It says, given the laws that we have, what is the best way, given and the various costs we, we have, what's the best way to sort of optimize social welfare. Okay, now, one may say, well, it's a bad law, so you should get rid of the law rather than trying to optimize it. And I, I don't disagree with that, but that's not the purpose. No one essay can try to deal with every single problem, and I didn't try to do, do that in this essay. Okay. Now, let me deal with a couple of the other issues that you mentioned. The individual versus the sovereign. Yes, this takes the individual's point of view. And I, I, I had the, for my reading of Foucault in this chapter, he liked that uh, as opposed to taking the sovereign's point of view. I don't know if I have the exact statement on that, but um, to me that wasn't a, a critique that he had. Uh, but. Well, so it's on page 250, to 252, to bottom of 252. To find what he says. Right. I mean, yeah. basically what he says, it, it simply means that economic behavior is the grid of intelligibility one will adopt yeah. on the behavior of a new individual. It also means that the individual becomes governmentalizable in a particular yeah. way, right? In a particular way, right? Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, I don't see any critique of that particular problem. Homo, homo economicus is the interface of government individual but does that mean that every individual is just saying that there are other motivations on, on individuals? Um, uh, so, anyway, I, I, I don't, there's nowhere, I, I don't think you can cite Bernard where he says, well, that's, 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 that's a worse view than taking it from the point of view of the sovereigns, which he does say is, is the French approach. So, he, he, let, me, let me make a couple more comments and we come back. He says, uh, well, he takes the individual approach, and I, and my reading of this essay overall, I may be wrong on that, was he, he didn't think that was inferior, at least, to taking the sovereign's approach. Now, um, on the capital, I mean, uh, on taking laws as given, I mean, you, you mentioned that on several different uh, occasions. Yes, it takes laws as given. Now, the same approach may be useful 
in discussing what laws we should have may be useful. So one has an analysis, let's say a, a benefit-cost analysis of a particular type of legislation. Let's say uh, whether drugs should be illegal or not. Right. We, have, we have a benefit-cost analysis of whether drugs should be illegal. And, one, uh, and I've done that, a lot of other people have done that. And one looks at a similar type of consideration. What's the benefit of having a law? Can we, can, can we, uh, can we uh, how much effect does it have on, on drug use? Uh, what's the cost of doing it? And is it worth having this law when there are various alternatives? For example, we could tax the use of drugs. So the same approach does, is an approach to laws in general. I agree. This essay doesn't try to do that because it becomes, you, 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 you have to go down other dimensions. You have to evaluate from in various ways what the law is doing and what the benefit, but you, you can take that benefit cost analysis and do that. And much of, much of evaluation of public policy, whatever the approach, is really implicitly doing that. Right. But not just laws, behaviors. Or behaviors. Right? Yeah. Any behavior. Yeah. We right. could subject any behavior to a kind of calculus to determine whether or not use of punishment, right, the state sanction. Well, say you take a state sanction means, you mentioned a couple of examples, I forgot what they were. But a state sanction would mean we say we have a law against this type of behavior. That's a state sanction. And therefore, you have to ask yourself, is it desirable or not to have that law? And then you have to have an analysis of it. I don't care if you take this approach or any other approach, you have to reach that conclusion. Right. Well, the, the only difference would be civil versus criminal, right? So in well, other words, so, 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 absolutely. So, so, so what would be criminalized would be those behaviors that when you go through your analysis, if you impose a form of criminal punishment versus civil liability, compensation, et cetera, it would most efficiently kind of bring that level of behavior to a level at which it minimizes social costs or maximizes social welfare, right? Absolutely. Right. Well, in my essay, I do distinguish between torts or civil law and criminal law, and I have a, a definition that may, you, people may not like, that criminal law is a, a, an activity is a crime as opposed to a civil violation if you cannot use a fine it, to deter that action. Uh, but if you can use a fine, then you, you say, well, it's part of tort law and so on, mm -hmm. you know, or mm -hmm. civil law and so on. If you can't do it, it becomes a crime. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I, I, but I think that distinction comes out of the analysis. You don't have to add that as a separate distinction. Right, but notice how radically regulamentary, how, how, how much kind of government analysis of social welfare would be going on if, in fact, we did that for every possible behavior, including being impolite, talking too much. Well, we um, may have a general principle, that the gov I mean, for a lot of issues, the, the effectiveness of the government is so poor that we, we don't want to try to regulate it, and that's my view. The government makes matters worse in a lot of areas rather than making them better. Uh, take the capital punishment issue. And you say, well, I have to make all, uh, somebody taking this approach has to make all these calculations. What's the alternative? What's, the, what's an alternative approach? What kind of calculations would one make? What kind of calculations would you make? Well, so I think one, your approach would be a, a one approach would be to, to make a huge calculation about whether or not a particular using executions is a good use of societal resources mm -hmm. along it, it requiring enormous amounts of measurements and Pretty agreements hard. on it's measurements on question. life, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So that's that that's is that difficult. is yeah, that's very difficult. Right. What's well, the alternative? Which, okay, well there are plenty of there are plenty of alternatives. I mean Well give me one. Well, you know, you could just uh, any de any deontological principle. You could come up with a principle that we don't take life or something like that, right? I mean, you know, right, there, there are many of alternatives. Well, then right? you have to analyze that principle. We don't take life for, because this reason and that reason. Right. And even right. though, right. even though we may have, we may be saving ten lives, we're not taking this life. Okay, you may right. want to do that. Right. But you still have to go through. If you try to probe behind uh, the phrasing, we don't take lives and make some sense out of it. You really have to go into some kind of analysis of this type. Um, well, 
not necessarily. I mean, you, you don't, don't necessarily, necessarily have to do. A, you don't necessarily have to do a social welfare maximizing if you've got a deontological well. principle. But my point is not to argue for one versus the other, right? Mine was an internal. I mean, mine was an internal critique of a social welfare maximizing approach to the death penalty, which is, in fact, we've got a lot of calculating to do, but we've got to do more than just figure out how many lives we're saving. Because it turns out we could be saving five lives, if that were true, if, the, if those studies were true, and yet it could be that with the amount of money that it takes to execute someone, which is, say, $2.5 million because of, you know, uh, judicial expenses and whatnot, we could save 20 lives by Healthcare, maybe healthcare, right, right, right. I don't right. even call okay. it. Any other approach has to do something like that. I mean, unless you want to avoid analysis and replace analysis by a phrase, we don't take lives. That's avoiding analysis. That's not analysis. You want to give analysis of a problem, you have to analyze it, and you say, well, why do I, why do I not want to take the life? What's the consequences, uh, plus and minus? Right. And if you don't want to do that to me, you're avoiding the question. You're not sol answering the question. Yeah. But I would say that uh, from your approach, which may be the right approach, one can't ex ante say whether or not one is or not in favor of the death. Absolutely. That's, all. That's right. what I said. One right. can come out with right. any conclusion about right. that. And the paper right. doesn't even take okay. a stand on that. Okay. And I could easily be convinced not to take okay. a, a, use capital punishment. <laughs> <Right. laughs> and, similarly, right. and, and similarly, for all behaviors, would also be subject to that. All, well, all behaviors. a lot of uncertainty in all this, yeah. And a model, a model sets out you know, various concepts. Now, to implement that model in terms of actual po uh, policy, you have to quantify these concepts. That's why I said that the analysis stimulated a lot of literature trying to quantify various concepts. What's the cost of doing this? Well, how much deterrence there is? Tremendous literature, controversial literature. These are not things easily discovered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not mm -hmm. saying one can just take the model and say, well, we want to do this and that and that. No, it requires various judgment. I'm willing okay. to make the judgment. We all have to make judgments when we're dealing with policy, but in order to have a stronger judgment, we want a firmer foundation. Okay. But when you say I'm a small government person, yeah, <laughs> where does that come from? It comes from a belief that governments usually make things worse rather than better for the bulk of the population. It's an analysis. It may be a wrong analysis, but that's the analysis, right? And some people may say that's not true. The governments are better than, say, the private sector in solving a lot of problems. Right, but I'm just trying to figure out how did, how did you come to that conclusion? Is it an evidence-based conclusion? I think so, but not a conclusion that one can say it's 100% uh, proven so that somebody else couldn't have a difference of opinion. Why do people differ on different public policies? I think most of the differences in, between people on public policies is not due to the fact that you've, your values are different than mine, but we have different evaluations of the consequences of different types of behavior. So it's a different judgment about magnitude. So when I say I'm a small government person, because I'm making the judgment that I think whatever the imperfections are in, let's say, the private sector, they're worse in terms of how we see government operate. Now, somebody else may come along and say, that's not how much, you know, the evidence for that is not so clear. In some areas, maybe it's different. I, I recognize that. But that's what it would be based on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And so just to get back to Foucault, and then okay. but François Duval have the yeah. last yeah, word. Yeah, you haven't. You, you should say something. Um, <laughs> there's a sense in which there's a sense in which I think that um, what Foucault is arguing, and and this will be for the next seminar then, because um, it comes out in the third and final lecture. There are only three that oh. uh, that deal there's with. There's supposed to be no good second acts. So now we're going to have a third. <laughs> 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 um, is that somehow embedded in the theory of subjectivity? that is part of the 1968 article and the distinction with French law, embedded in that notion of subjectivity is the conclusion that, in your words, I'm a small government person. Right. Well, so that's the that somehow is the is I think what that we doesn't need necessarily to follow from this essay, by the way. Okay. You okay. can come read this essay, believe in the essay, and say I'm a big government person because there's there are tools to decide. I mean, it needs other types of evidence. I don't know. Foucault, I guess, considered himself a socialist. No. No. What a left. 
Left. Yeah, I know what he, I know what he means. So but he's, no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> left. But le what did left mean in terms of role of government? Okay. What? What? Let's say left usually means more government. At this less. time, he was in search of a new of a new kind of governmentality. Yeah. And, uh, not particularly. That, that was that was that was a, the, the research of, of a new of a new possibility in politics. That was the reason he, he works about governmentality. Right, yeah. In fact, right. I mean, in, in and in here he explicitly says that what is lacking in socialist thought is a theory of governmentality. In in I think it's in these particular lectures and um, well, and so and so to a certain extent what he's doing when he's probing you. Right is trying to explore forms of governmentality, and particularly the form of neoliberal governmentality. Yeah, I mean, so, but he, he, in, in, in probing that, I don't know what I, mean, I don't know enough about Foucault to know where he can, where, where he ends up. But in probing that, you have to make some evaluations. Is the government going to do X or Y? What should be the role of? I mean, I, I put it in a very pragmatic way because these are the issues. We tend to deal with it again. What should be the role of government in health care policy? Okay, so that takes an analysis. I don't care what conclusion you come out with, or whether you say the government should be, you know, controlling prices and controlling all the behavior. You have to, you have to have some analysis of that problem. And when, when I say uh, I'm a small government person, it means not that there shouldn't be any government. Government is crucial to any functioning society. But for a lot of these policies, my judgment and the evidence is limited. In, in many of these areas, is that the government, by putting the government in, you're going to make matters worse. Now, somebody can come with a different conclusion, but I don't see how you can resolve these issues. The, to me, the crucial issue is if you want to resolve these issues, you have to have some analysis. And analysis is going to take you down the path of considering costs and benefits. Now, people may have different benefits and different costs and different assessments. You may have put value on people having freedom and not being coerced by the government. All that, sure, I recognize that. But you, you don't have to have some analysis like that. And this is just one particular form of, an, of, of that type of analysis. <laughs> so I'm going to give the last word to François Eval to close the discussion. <laughs> last but word. While you think of <laughs> your <laughs> <one next>. <laughs> <laughs> while you think of your last word, I will just say though that from an internal critique perspective, I would say. Everything you said, I can buy within the system except making any kind of claim about being a small government person or not, because it's just, it's just, it's subject to a kind of calculus, a complex kind of calculus that we need to make in every case, and I don't know what the outcome is ahead of time, right? No, I agree. I don't disagree with you. You need that calculus. And a lot of the areas, we don't have enough evidence to make that calculus with any degree of confidence. So one is making a judgment. When, when one says one thinks the government should be extended or, or contracted, one is making a judgment in the, in, in the face of very imperfect information, imperfect knowledge about what the likely outcomes will, will be. Mm -hmm. Not a judgment based on certainty. Mm -hmm. And certainly the framework I'm giving, I want to stress this, Again, before we give you the last word, <laughs> now, I want to stress this, that the, the essay I wrote on crime and punishment could easily be used by people who believe the government should be dominating the economy. I mean, mm -hmm. so there's nothing in there that says mm -hmm. one, one concludes that one is a small government. Well, person. before I give him the last word, <laughs> except, for the, except for the fact that you limit to the definition of crime. Right, so you're, you're bracketing the space in which we're going to explore government intervention. And then within there, you're bracketing it more. Whereas I think that you would want to say, actually, so had you rewritten, if you could rewrite it now, you would say, same analysis applies to all behavior. I can't tell you what the outcome is. I can't tell you whether I'm small government or big government. Do the work. Well, you would say, you would say this particular framework doesn't lead to any conclusion about whether you're a big government or a small government person, because you right. rely on other types of evidence. Right to try to get absolutely. I did say something like that elsewhere in a lot of, a lot of different ways. Okay, <laughs> we'll read that too for the next <laughs> seminar. Also, uh, yes. <laughs> I think uh, the discussion uh, show 
two aspects in, in, in your analysis. So one <coughs> is uh, an analysis like uh, a critic of specific uh, public policy. I think uh, in this respect, uh, there, is, there is no problem. But at the same time, on after you, uh, we can observe that uh, people search to uh, build, to set up a new kind of penalty and so on. On this other side, that is not critic, but that is a normative side, where we search to rebuild, to, to imagine, to figure out a new kind of art of punishment. I, in fact, the both are embedded in your, in, in your work. Foucault doesn't have any, uh, you, you were useful for Foucault in your, uh, you are very useful for Foucault in this uh, uh, new critical uh, version. And you give to him the idea, the idea that it is possible to make a criticism of governmentality which was internal. And that is, you are a positivist. You take a set, a set of law and you ask the question, effective, uh, optimal or not, and you give response. Okay. For that, you uh, build a specific uh, set tool, dispositive <coughs> of analysis, of economic analysis. The question, I think the main question come when we uh, come to the normative uh, dimension. On at this point, you are in conflict, in competition with other dimension. For example, a moral one. For example, deterrence. If you, if you, if you are Kantian, you are you are by Kant. Kantian. Kantian, yes. Kantian, Emmanuel Kantian, the, oh, yeah. the German philosopher. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Kant say the main rule, the main moral rule is it is forbidden to take a man like a mean, you have always to take the man like an end. I don't know. So, yeah. deterrence, okay. what is deterrence in this, in this respect? When you punish, when your tactic of punishment, that is to give a penalty to a person, to protect in the, in the consideration to other persons. That is not a manner to take one like a mean to a final end, to an other end. So that is so. And at this, at this point, you are, you are in the normative uh, dimension. You are in competition with other normative. And you can, uh, again, ask the question about the uh, the, the effectiveness, the economic effectiveness of, of, uh, of uh, the, the, this other dimension. Yes, yes, it is clear. My second remark will be, our problem is certainly a, 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 the main problem about punishment is what? That is not, that is not the, the badness of man. That is a lack of information. Before the crime, you can only be uh, in. You, you can only observe crime after the crime. Well, I think your difficulty or the difficulty of punishment, if punishment has the goal to deter the future crime, that is. The, the, this tool to use the, the, the penalty 
to make that is a very difficult one. What, what would be the dream or the horror? That would be the capacity to prevent the crime before the crime, to know. And, and, and that is the reason, because we have to face with a lack, with this situation of love, of love, of lack of, of information. So, um, but that is a, this uh, last observation is uh, a very difficult one, because that means to build an effective uh, punishment politics, we have to know everything. What is, for you, for you that is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank so, you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.